Welcome to Eastside Group's podcast, where each week Pastor Chad Mann and Emily Watson will chat about the need for discipleship, what it is, and how we as believers and as a church are working towards being disciples who make disciples. If you're new to our podcast, Eastside is a church who exists to transform Fort Smith and beyond. Our purpose here at Eastside is to gather, grow, and go. Learn more about us at myeastside.tv. Let's get started. All right, well, welcome back. It's Pastor Chad for our Eastside Groups podcast. And again, it's another week without our co-host, Miss Emily Watson. Um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we were in Kansas City talking with our church planning partner, Ray Peoples in New City Church. And so this week, we are in Ogden, Utah with our church planning partners uh, from Redemption Church, Utah. So we have uh, Bobby Wood, and Daniel Savage, and Nick Erickson. 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 Oh, Nerickson. Nerickson. So, you know, a lot of people call me Chad Mann as one name. They, what's, your name? Chad 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 <laughs> what's your last name? Chad. Chad Mann. What's your last name? Oh, gosh. But, so, anyway, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you guys for letting us come and, and spend some time because we know you're taking some time out of your day to allow us to sit down and visit with you guys. And, Anytime it can be with the legendary Chad Man. Oh, no. We're going to make time for him. It's it's Chad Chad Man. Man. (laughs) It's one word. So, anyway, I just, you know, as a podcast, we've been talking a lot about discipleship and disciple making. And, you know, I think one thing that comes to mind is, you know, when we're serving in particular churches, oftentimes we learn methods of that church or philosophies of that church. Like, you know, this is how we do kids' ministry. Well, this is how we do student ministry. This is our philosophy of family ministry or worship even. And so as you guys have you know, come out of the local church, um, serving in various um, environments, um, cities, and now you're here in the Salt Lake City area in Utah where there's, you know, it's Mormonism. I mean, you've got this influence of LDS. Could, could you speak a little bit about you know what that has been like for you guys as since you've been out here? How has that affected how you have done ministry? Has it changed anything or the way you viewed disciple making? Yeah, that's a good question, man. You, you know, I think when you think of the enormity of Salt Lake City, 2.6 million people, 98% lost, not many churches around, not many Christians around, so, you know, thinking about it from that perspective, it's from a mission standpoint. You know, in the big picture, the big dream, the big vision is that there will be churches, gospel preaching churches in every community in Salt Lake City. You know, but to see that happen, it, you got to go back. And how does that happen? Well, that means churches here have to have a culture of discipleship where people are so in tune with what Christ wants them to do and they're equipped and called out and ready to serve and ready to be sent out to plant new churches. So, you know, what it, it's helped us think through is what does that look like from our church at Redemption Church? How do we raise up a culture of disciples that are gonna be sent out? And so one of the things you gotta do is rethink your metrics, you know? You know, our metrics ultimately are not how many people can we pack into a Sunday morning gathering, right? Or how many services we can do or how many small groups we can have. Really, our biggest metric is gonna be How many people can we send out? How many churches can we plant? How many missionaries can we send out? How many people are sharing the gospel with people in their neighborhood and they're making disciples? Those are the kind of metrics we're looking at. Mm -hmm. So our win is not going to be the same win that maybe a lot of other churches count, you know, budgets and was it budgets and butts is what they call (laughs) the measures they look at. Our butts and budgets. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) So we're looking at sending, you know, who can we send out and how many can we send out? And at the end of the day, that that's gotta be our paradigm shift for us. Yeah. And one of, one of our core values as a church is to multiply everything. Mm -hmm. And that's done partially through discipleship. And I know you guys kind of use a similar, method that we use um, with just how we do discipleship but our whole goal with our discipleship groups in particular is that after a period of time those break off and they make new groups and they make new disciples and so instead of addition adding butts to the seed or adding budget or whatever Mm -hmm. we're actually talking about multiplication Mm -hmm. and where a group of 
five in a discipleship group after a year, if they're all ready to split off and start a new group, well, now you have five new groups. You've yeah. multiplied exponentially. Mm -hmm. And then that translates, like Bobby's saying, into the mindset of when we get ready, hopefully one day, to start a new church, people already have that in their mindset that it's not about building one one thing, it's about multiplying it. So I'm willing to go. I love redemption, but I'm willing to go to this city over here where the, there needs to be a church. Yeah. And so the discipleship process obviously helps people become disciples, but it also builds into the culture of the church, this sending idea, this multiplying idea, so that when we get to the point where we can start a new church, we've got people already ready to go. Yeah, it's good. Compared to past ministries and just my own mindset shift, yeah, I used to think, you know, as long as I provided an appropriate program that had a discipleship feel to it, that, that was enough. And I'm not saying those don't do that, but when I came out here, the vast amount of people that come to Christ literally know very little. And that it, I, it became more apparent and aware to me the need to show a disciple and teach them what it means to grow in Christ. You can't just hand them the ball and walk away. But, we, but then also in my own life, how much I need to emphasize and really spend a lot of energy and time into uh, my own personal discipleship, but then also to lead others in Christ, my children right now who are growing and you know they're not going to just accidentally fall into this they need to be shown and taught and we have a lot of new believers in our church and it's just been really apparent to us how valuable one we're seeing them grow by following with um, brothers and sisters in Christ and learning what it means to be a follower of Christ and really keeping the principles that we want to keep at the core they're seeing it because through scripture it doesn't you know it's very clear in what it is God wants and calls for us. And so it's, that shift changed a lot when I moved out here. Uh, more just because the vast lostness and the, the amount of knowledge that really wasn't there. Um, where in other cultures I've lived in, the gospel, we almost inoculated to it. You've heard right. it enough that you've almost built an immunity to where everybody would claim to be a part of a church and a follower of Christ. And right. Not to say that they are or not. Yeah. But it's been a little bit more apparent here. Yeah. That need. Yeah, we were talking on the way here um, in the car um, about, you know, I've only been out here a few times, you know. So all in all, I've maybe spent 10 days in Utah in my whole life. Best 10 days of your life. It's been a wonderful 10 <laughs> days. Um, but, you know, as I've had friends out here, uh, you know, living out here. And this partnership with you guys, which is also a friendship to me. Uh, into our church that where we're from you know kind of in the Bible Belt you can have these conversations with people and they're oh I've already heard that well I've heard that you try and talk about the gospel and, oh, I've heard that or hey I did that when I was six you know and they don't even say what that is they just say oh I did that when I was a kid you know um, but being out here it seems like you know, maybe there's more opportunity to talk about the gospel. And it's a true gospel that's different than the one that has been supposedly the gospel out here in this area, which would be, you know, Latter-day Saints. Um, so are you experiencing, I mean, do you see more openness as people are, you know? Um, yeah, I would say, man, you know, it's just like in a, any kind of religious culture. Just like the South is a religious culture, Arkansas or South Carolina or Texas, you, you have a religious culture that builds the framework. And here we do too, it's just, it's Mormonism. And that builds the culture of our landscape. So there are a lot of people here that they think that they're Christians. They think that they know Jesus. They just think that they have more of the truth than we do. Right. You know, we only have a small sliver of the truth while they got the full piece. So our challenge in evangelism and sharing the gospel is helping them understand not that they have more of it, it's that they never had it to begin with. Gotcha. And so that's where our, our piece comes in. That's a little bit different, I think, than the South, but it is a very religious culture. Now, I'd say the good side of that is this, this group of people who have left the LDS church, you know, they're just spiritualistic or they're skeptic or they're agnostic. This group of people, and what we're finding is those people are very open to gospel conversations because they have left the LDS church They've realized it's false. They Googled on the internet, you know, Mormonism. 
found out that Joseph Smith and all his history and baggage, and they know this isn't true. That's not right. But I was talking to a guy last week, and we're sitting down for coffee, and he's like, I, I just, I know the LDS church isn't true, but I can't let go. I, I know God exists. And he said, I'm just trying to figure that out. Yeah. And so I was walking through him with the gospel, and he just peppered me with questions. He was hitting question after question. We talked for two and a half hours, just boom, 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 boom. Yeah. And it's like, you, you get openness there a ton, because yeah. they know they're empty. They know they have nothing. Yeah. They know they don't have any hope. Isn't that amazing? I mean, doesn't that? Ex- I mean, oh, I awesome. see the excitement yeah. on your face as you're sharing that. Well, what's, here's what's really cool about that story. When we met at the theater before we moved into our building we're in now, this guy was the theater manager. Okay. And quirky guy, fun guy, yeah. but he. You know, but he's seen you, like he's. Yeah. This I've had gospel conversations. Bobby with him hasn't four talked years to him ago. in four years. <laughs> he left and went to New York. He comes back. He still has Bobby's number. And four years later, he's getting to share the gospel. Amen. I think that's something too for Utah specifically. I don't know how else to describe it. It's the long game here. Yeah. We, when you're sharing the gospel, we're not looking for quick conversions. We're not trying to get fast. It's it's the long game where you see these guys come back four years later and say, "Hey, remember we talked?" Because they remember. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons why we do um, uh, door hangers, even if people that don't want to hear it, because a lot of times they'll take the door hanger. They'll put it in their fridge or in their junk drawer. But when a moment of crisis hits, they're not turning to their war. They're not looking, they're going to pull that back out. And it's happened a couple times. I wouldn't say the abundance, but it's happened to where opportunities uh, with discipleship even specifically, it's not a quick fix. Yeah. Yeah. It's intentional. I think, too, another challenge is similar to what Bobby was saying, is that people who have come out of the predominant religion here, they have to unlearn what they've already learned their whole life. And sometimes they struggle with, even, even people who have given their life to Christ fully, they understand the true gospel. But then in the discipleship process, they're trying to separate what came from the Book of Mormon and what came from the Bible. Like they just, there's a lot of baggage with it. Yeah. And so there's a lot of people who, they just struggle with knowing, where did I read that? And they have to literally go, look it up. Did I read that in the Book of Mormon or did it, when I was a kid or did I read that in the Bible? And so they have to unlearn a lot of the tradition, a lot of the um, just things that they, they did out of habit growing yeah. up in the Mormon church. And it's, it's a struggle for a lot of people and it's very difficult because like Bobby said, they have this spiritual background, but the vast majority of it is, is false religion. Right. So they're trying to separate, okay, I know Jesus is real. I know he's Jesus of the Bible is true. He is the Son of God. He's not a Son of God. You know, there's all these doctrines, but they're trying to separate. What did I learn as a Mormon? Yeah. What did I, what did I read in the Bible? And sometimes that can be very difficult. Yeah. And to speak to that point, this one girl who I think we all know here, she became a Christian, followed Jesus. And so, you know, she comes to church on Sundays and she listens to the sermon. She's a part of, you know, the church life. But then we have this one lady sit down with her and just kind of walk through some really foundational things, I mean, things that we take for granted, you know, think yeah. about, about the Bible, about God. And she's walking through with her these foundational things of Christianity. And she's like, man, I, I've never heard that. I thought I understood this now and I don't. And, and it goes, speaks to the nature of discipleship mm-hmm. where we've realized like, what, what happens on Sunday morning in the messages and the sermons, we're, we're teaching the Bible, we're preaching the Bible, we're showing them the Word, but we have to help people learn how to feed themselves, mm-hmm. how to feed others, mm-hmm. and so we're trying to pour into them, yeah. but that has to happen more than just on Sunday mornings. Right, it's called equipping the saints yep. for the work of the ministry, right. disciple yep. making. That's right. And sometimes it's like, you know, pastors forget that. Mm-hmm. That's part of our job. It's a primary thing for us to do, right? That's right. Is equip the saints for the work of the ministry. I used to get frustrated because people I was leading, the people that I was leading maybe didn't understand something. To the dawn on me that no one was actually ever teaching me. I was assuming they should know it. Yeah. I'm assuming they should follow it. And then like, well, you know, they've never been taught this. So maybe instead, that's what I should start with. Or they've never seen it modeled. Or, 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 exactly. Well, probably all of us when we were growing up, discipleship was Sunday nights at five o'clock before the evening service. Like 
we called it the same discipleship training is what we called yeah. it. That wasn't discipleship. That was another class similar to Sunday school. We called it discipleship for whatever reason, and it wasn't. It, it was just another class. You know, there was learning that was happening, but it yeah. wasn't true discipleship. And, and these are good things yeah, to learn. Exactly, you're studying the Bible, but it's just a, it's a, it's a piece and of I think, discipleship. I think. Right. I think if you asked, there's also prayer, accountability, personal holiness, right. Right. obedience. Right. right. I mean, there's a. I think if you ask 10, 10 average Christians to define discipleship, I would venture to say nine of them would really struggle yeah. to define it. And that's funny. You might get one. Yeah, and so that's the thing. I was reading a book on a plane, um, developing a disciple-making culture, and I cannot remember the author's name. Uh, Mike Green? Is that Mike Green? No, but he's in that circle. These are guys that are with uh, For Him Publications and disciple making networks like there's a bunch of these guys I know I'm so thankful that there's a bunch of guys out there in the church right now that are like hitting it with disciple making like this is what it is and the big question that keeps coming up and this is what I was about to refer to is can you define what a disciple is most pastors can't you know that was in the book he's like I've asked this prominent church leader you know because he was uh, brought in to uh, Post Falls, Idaho, Jim Putnam, mm-hmm. you know, real life ministries and their disciple making stuff. So, hey, we think we can do what you're doing. Let's show, we want to know how you increase from 50 people to 600 in two years, you know, and, and my team's ready to go. And then the point was, okay, I want your team here. Let's go ahead and write down the definition of a disciple. And he said he could see, in the book, he's writing about how he could see his face begin, beginning to flush red. As he looked around at his staff, and some of them were looking around and like unsure what to write down, because he knew they were going to, they knew we we're going to have different definitions, probably. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's okay to have different definitions, but they need to be kind of saying the same thing. So, what is a disciple? And in the book, he talked about, you know, uh, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So he says, you know, a disciple is someone who's following Jesus, being changed by Jesus. And being on mission for Jesus. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So in that verse, in that proclamation from the Lord Jesus, he says, that's what being sub is. You following him, you're being changed by him, you're being on mission for him. I thought that is so simple to 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 remember, you know? Well, and that, in that definition, it encompasses a lot of the things that sometimes seem like competing things. Like some people say, Word church is all about evangelism. And they kind of put discipleship to the side. But then you may have another church where we're all about discipleship. But the thing is, if you're doing discipleship right, it and you're challenging your, your other disciples to do evangelism, mm-hmm. and to pray, and to read the word, and to take care of your family and spend time with your wife, you know, all the questions that we ask our groups, if you're doing those things, it's really an all encompassing yeah. thing. You're even worship. I mean, you're worshiping right. as you're reading the Word. And, yeah. and as Nick and I are sharing what we learned about in the Word this week in our D group meeting, that's, that's worship as yeah. well. Yeah. I remember about a decade ago, I was at a WMU meeting, and I was sharing on discipleship. And I, I remember how vague and surface level I was in that at the time. Like I can almost cringe to think about it. Um, I wasn't wrong on what I was sharing. I think there's no YouTube. But. Yeah, thank <laughs> the Lord. Yeah, let's go find um, that. Yeah, no one was taping me because I, I was I was teaching it accurately, but I wasn't really giving any any meat to it. I remember it now, like I'm like oh man, that has changed over the last ten years. Yeah. That's just my understanding because I think you you think in your mind sometimes as long as I'm saying this word and, mm-hmm. and I'm putting it out there, it's enough. It, no, we want it to be practical. Yeah, if it's not practical, it's not useful. Yeah. In that sense, the word is just not useful. Discipleship is well, and that's the part where you, you know the simplicity of that definition. You've got the information side of it. Like we need the information to know who God is, who we're worshiping, what the Bible says, mm-hmm. and then following after Him, making the transforming. We got to obey. It's a great commission. The yeah. obedience side, follow after Jesus, to right. follow, do what He asks us to do. Mm-hmm. And then the first part of the Great Commission is the going. It's yeah. the mission. Yeah. That then disciples then make disciples. Yeah. It's multiplication. It, it, it it's is. pretty simple. Yeah, it's encompassing a lot there. There's multiplication, there's sanctification, there's all the Asians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, 
something else I wanted to, to talk about was, um, you know, when we're thinking about going back to, you know, having to unlearn or unthink some things with church planting or disciple making in church planting, you guys brought up multiply. Multiply everything. You know, it's one of your values. And I just, as you're sharing that, I'm like, yeah. Yeah, that's so good. But unfortunately, I don't think many churches have that value because we're like, why do we want to send anyone out? Why do we want to build a budget and give it away to anyone we're sending away? Like, you know, I think a lot of us have been trained in the church as pastors, like butts and budgets. Mm -hmm. The more, the better. The more money, the better. Let's just all here. So to multiply everything, and part of multiplying everything is planting churches and sending people out to go do this stuff, is almost just hard to swallow for, for people. For well, church leaders, you even know. even in our in our groups themselves, sometimes people struggle. They they get so close with their D group, their discipleship group, that after a year they don't want to break up. Yeah, it's like oh, yeah. this has been such a great year. So yeah. we really have to hammer home that idea. The whole purpose behind this is to multiply, multiply. and to break yeah. off. And you can still have get together with coffee with your old yeah. group. But but then that's this is human nature. Yeah. It's so very that came up in my group, and then I was reading a book. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> I'll read the book. <laughs> um, and it talked about, I can't remember exactly what, the way it worded it, but it was on that top any, topic and he wrote, we need to thank God that those 12 disciples didn't say, we're just going to stay together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, but that they went out and began mm-hmm. to multiply so the gospel could be shared. And so, you know, but, but you know what we found with that though, and this is crazy about you multiply everything. You know, we live in a transient town where people come in for the military, we have an Air Force base, they come in for a job or they leave. And if you multiply everything, you've got multiple worship team, you know, we've got multiple people who can preach. We're trying to train up new pastors, mm-hmm. new planners, new children's workers, new everything, and multiply all those different areas. When people leave, our church doesn't miss a beat. Yeah. We keep going. Yeah. And so from just the church health standpoint, what's yeah. crazy is when you're sending people out, and you're, you have a culture of discipleship, your church still grows. I mean, God yeah. still, I mean, does a work there even yeah. in your own church. Yeah. And so it's funny, it when we try to hold yeah. people in, yeah. Yeah. the opposite happens. Yeah. But when we release people and we have a culture of building them up and discipling and training and growing, and the church is still healthy and grows like crazy. Yeah. When you have to ask the hard question, what is the point of all that, right? So if it's butts and budgets, then you're winning. But if you read the gospel, that's not the point. Right. And it's hard to get yourself thinking, okay, how do we expand the kingdom? And if it is send our best guy to the next town over, even though we love him and he's phenomenal to our church, that's what we have to do. It's not even that it should be. We have to do it. Now, that doesn't make it easy. It doesn't make it us love it. I want to tell share Robbie's story. Yeah. So we had our per- first pastoral resident. And this guy, he, uh, he was basically raised up to be sent out. That was our whole plan. So he's a year in and he's a, a gifted worship leader. He's doing all these other things for us, leading small group. And we were helping to restart a new church in Morgan um, over just over the valley over there. So the new church gets started and we had this big sending out of Robbie and, you know, people were sad to see him go, him and Meg and, you know, all the hugs and everything else. And it wasn't even a month later. We had four new young couples with ministry experience, new pastoral resident that just replaced this one guy. Yeah. <laughs> four replacing him. Yeah. And again, that's not a guarantee. It's not a promise. That's right, right, happen. right. But I was just so amazed. Like, you know, God, God's faithfulness. Yes. And faithful. Point me on that. Robbie, musically talented. Then we picked up two or three more people on the music end. Like, mm-hmm. beyond. It's un- unbelievable how that works on every level. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this goes by fast. You know, I yeah. feel like we can sit here <laughs> we and talk, talk for two hours. Oh, yeah. And I love it. I love it. And but you know, we've got to wrap things up. And I, I do appreciate you guys taking time to do this. And and you know, we always end the segment by saying, you know, make disciples. But I love. I think it's more appropriate, you know, to say 
you know, make disciples, multiply everything. I love that. And just, we thank you for the work you're doing here in Utah. And it's a pleasure to be partners with you, Nick Erickson, all right, <laughs> Daniel Savage, Bobby Wood. And so um, I want to do this again. You know, maybe we can do a part two. Yeah, that'd be uh, awesome. We come back in, but just thanks for being with us today. And uh, we'll make disciples and multiply everything. everything. That's right. Thanks for tuning in to Eastside Group's podcast. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share our podcast on Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. We'll see you in the next one.